And welcome to a uh, perhaps borderline narcoleptic episode of the Oddity Archive. Look at it this way, uh, you're going to get a nice heaping helping of the mellow were than usual, warm, fuzzy, friendly, nostalgic, and slightly melancholy side of the archive. So anyway, uh, today's episode spawns from something that happened a few years ago now. But uh, I made this uh, now pretty infamous episode on a pair of mystery 8mm films that I had found at a thrift store, and the infamous part being that they both turned out to be pornographic. Well, uh, one of those films starts off rather deceptively, and I noted it in the episode, but it starts you off thinking that it's going to be one of those souvenir films that you would find in those uh, tourist trap gift shops back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And at the time, a small handful, really, of viewers decided to come back at me with the whole oh, that was just cope, Benny Boy, there is no such thing as a souvenir film sort of thing. So, uh, of course, it prodded me into trying to start to build up a little collection of souvenir films, so I can prove that they exist now, if nothing else. And, uh, yeah, we're going to take a little trip around the world today, so uh, I know I'm in vacation mode here. Uh, I haven't shaved in a couple of days and feeling real nice and laid back here, so let's get into it. Let's kick things off here with some excerpts from some films put out by the one and only of today's companies that is still in business and still doing the whole scenic film thing. Uh, of course, nowadays they're putting it all out on Blu-ray. But uh, yeah, we're going to kick things off with some stuff from Finley's Holiday Films. Take them home with you with the National Park Series on Blu-ray, DVD, and mobile device from Finley Holiday Films. Each one includes a complete tour of the park. We interrupt this box segment with a mini Ben's Junk installment, largely because I have a lot to say about this first round of films, and I think this intro would be better suited to the Ben's Junk format. But anyway, once upon a time, you could pop into really any number of gift shops here in the U.S. and find some kind of package akin to this. And uh, with regards to this one, this one really was purchased at the original SeaWorld in San Diego, California, probably around 1972. And I only know it was purchased at SeaWorld because... It's still got the price tag on it. And yeah, $13.98. So assuming it is 1972, I pumped it into the inflation calculator. And as of my making this, it's just shy of $100. So yeah, these things were not cheap. Uh, these were meant for the souvenir buyers that wanted more than just a refrigerator magnet or something like that. But uh, anyway, if we go to the back again here, let's take a look at this paragraph here. So uh, it touts it as having some sort of accompanying audio cassette. And uh, by the way, yeah, Finley misspelled their own company name there. But uh, with regards to the audio cassette, it seems to be total bunk. Uh, the only Finley packages I can find with cassettes are their 35 millimeter slide packages. And these cases are just too small to fit uh, and still have the film reel in there to fit even a loose audio cassette. And I dug around online, I can't find any pictures of any kind of setup like that or some sort of bundle or even some stray audio cassette that looks like it might play in tandem with this. So my best guess is that if there ever were tapes to be run with these movies, they were either sold separately or they were touting something that they planned to implement but just simply never did. But uh, anyway, with regards to these plastic case types, I have another one also from San Diego, strangely enough, from the San Diego Zoo. And I think it's also from about 1972. And it looks like, with regards to all of these plastic case sort of deals, the foam that holds the film in place has, not just on mine, but I think in general, has completely rotted away. 
And not only that, on mine, the foam rotted right onto the film. So uh, with regards to my two of this setup, I have cleaned up the film goo and I've created a totally ghetto new foam fix there. But uh, if nothing else, the film doesn't rattle around in there anymore, so it's secure. Now in case my replacement foam rots, <laughs> check with me in another 30 years, I did take the precaution of adding a few feet of just regular white leader to mine. So if this does decay and it sticks, you know, it'll only be to plain white leader. Of course, another 30 years down the road, I think that could be the least of my concerns. Uh, vinegar syndrome and that sort of thing. Uh, thankfully, none of mine have it yet. So otherwise, uh, with regards to the packaging of these Finley reels, this was not their original design. I do have one of their original design, and it was a little more austere, a, a very early blister pack sort of thing. Obviously, this has been opened, but there you go. Now, getting back to the survival rate with these things, I've noticed that out of the five Finley's reels that I own, Finley reels, all of them are supposed to be in color and all of them have faded to some degree. And this one in particular, Capistrano, and uh, yeah, they're all Californian. Uh, the Capistrano one is completely faded to just a horrible, nasty red, uh, to the point where I don't think any amount of color correction could ever do anything about it. But worse yet, this particular one has shrunk a bit, uh, to the point where my film scanner just straight up rejected it, and I was just barely able to get it to run through my regular, everyday projector. For what it's worth, when possible, I have tried to level out the color a bit for some of today's footage. Anyway, uh, truly finally getting down to business here, I'm only going to excerpt three out of my five Finley reels. So we'll do the two San Diego reels, and then we'll do this one from Las Vegas. And I think the Vegas one is really the keeper of the lot. Uh, it just shows a slice of Americana that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, as far as dates go, uh, you know, I only have visual clues to go by. So judging by the cars on the road and the names on the marquees and uh, haven't you always wanted to see Billy Daniels and the idiots? But uh, anyway, given the clues on here, I'm going to say this is from somewhere in the 1962 to 65 range. Now, one last point of business here before I finally get started. All of today's reels, not just the Finley ones, are silent. And I mean it, silent, silent. So just so there's something on the audio portion of this posting, I have put in some of my own songs from some of my ongoing and or past projects. If it's not your thing, feel free to mute the audio and uh, just keep those Pink Floyd records handy. But uh, yeah, you're not going to miss any commentary or anything if you decide to mute it.
This next one is admittedly the boring one of the lot, but since it does represent a certain slice of lost Americana, I feel like I should talk about this one, certainly. But I think this is going to be one of those times where the discussion is more interesting than the footage. But anyway, once upon a time, uh, certainly American Airlines, though there were others, had a bit of a side hustle going on, and uh, they were doing some kind of high-rolling, really, souvenir stuff. Most famously, uh, certainly American Airlines was putting out these reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes and real nice chock-full ones, uh, three and three-quarter inches per second and 1,800-foot reels, and it would be the music you'd hear, at least the first-class people certainly would hear in the airport lounge before takeoff, or a little later on when they started doing in-flight music and the headphones and all that, that stuff. So uh, all pretty major artists, be it uh, Exotica, like Martin Denny, or maybe some Sergio Mendez, that sort of stuff. So uh, TWA during the 60s was doing something a little different. Whereas, say, American Airlines was focused on audio TWA was focused on the visual end of things. So they, on the side, were selling souvenir slides and 8 and Super 8 millimeter films, all at 7 to 16 bucks a pop. Now, to me, these films are just a crushing disappointment and truly a missed opportunity. But uh, before I get into that, uh, the film we're going to look at here is Flight to Ireland. Now, in my mind, since it's an airline, you'd think they'd want to have some sort of aerial motif going on. Like, you'd think it would be an aerial tour of Ireland, almost as if you were looking out the plane window. That doesn't happen. Or, since it's TWA, they'd want to toot their own horn and give you a little look around the seating main part of their planes at the time. That doesn't happen. The only real TWA stuff you get to see is only super briefly the plane touching down and taking back off at the end. So what we're left with is a truly bland, boring, vanilla souvenir film, and certainly the most boring one I've seen to date. And it is Ireland. I mean, there is stuff to see there, but it's almost like they systematically avoided it. But since we've discussed it here, I guess I am now obligated to run at least some of it. So, from 1967, TWA presents Flight to Ireland.
This next film isn't really a souvenir film, but it is a travelogue, and I do believe these were sold at some gift shops and duty-free type places, mostly during the 50s, so I think it is pertinent to include it here. Now, uh, this particular reel, alas, was not purchased at a gift shop, but instead I, I was able to pretty easily track this one down, thanks to the price tag. It was purchased at the Crescent Department Store in Spokane, Washington, uh, defunct since 1988, and it sold for the princely sum of $5.95 back in the early mid-50s. So uh, adjust that for inflation. Now, uh, these are pretty dang common amongst film collectors, and at any given time on Fleabay, you should be able to find at least a small handful of these things. But uh, yeah, let's take a look at one of the many installments from the World Parade series from Castle Films. And uh, these mostly came out during the 50s, though the series did start out in the 40s. And this one in particular is from 1952, so we're right in the middle of the Korean War here, though it's not referenced, obviously. And uh, what we have here is kind of a semi-conceptual piece. So what we're dealing with is a, a slice of life, a day in the life, from a tourist's perspective, of Paris. France, not Texas. And, uh, yeah, you get to see everything you would expect out of Paris, uh, including some of the nightlife. And, uh, yeah, I, of course, will run that part. Now, uh, on a technical level here, for whatever strange reason, of the films that we're properly looking at today, I just could not get a decent pass at this thing through my film scanner. As such, I had to settle for digging out the slicer, as I call it, my old crappy, springy, metal, slightly rusty projector screen, and dig out my projector and just had to settle for pointing the camcorder at the screen.
if my copyright sleuthing is any good, it looks like all of the films in today's episode either slid into the public domain between the early 80s and early 2000s, or were just never submitted for copyright in the first place. And given that most of them are only 50 footers, so we're talking on average maybe four minutes a reel here, I see no reason not to run the last two reels of today's episode in their entirety. And uh, yeah, we're going to do just that. But uh, let's talk about this first one a bit here. So uh, this one was purchased overseas, and it is footage uh, from and purchased in Bruges, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, Belgium. And I was uh, kind of scratching my head at the box to this one because it's almost like a random mishmash of Dutch and French on the box. Well, I looked it up, and uh, this is part of the Flemish region of Belgium, so I guess that's just kind of normal there. Uh, it tells you what I know, and I still might not be all that accurate. But anyway, here is the box in question. This is part of the Visions du Monde series, or a worldview in English. And I can only guess that the significance of the number 58 on the box here is that maybe it dates to 1958, or maybe it's number 58 in a series, or maybe it's just totally arbitrary. Who knows? But uh, yeah, I cannot pin down the date on this one. Having said that, late 50s does not seem unrealistic at all. Now, with regards to the footage proper, it's really not super remarkable. I mean, it's nice and pretty and everything. But uh, the reason I want to run this one is out of all the color reels of these souvenir films that I've built up, it's the only one where the color has somehow managed to stay just real nice and rich and vibrant. So if nothing else, I want to run this one just so you can see and we can all see uh, as close as possible, what these things looked like brand new out of the box way back when. Now, unfortunately, there is a bit of a catch here. Towards the end of the reel, it does start to jitter quite a bit. We can never have it all, can we?
To close things out today, I want to say aloha by running a short little film from Kodak. And I do mean that. They didn't use all the 50 potential feet on the reel. And the whole thing clocks in at under three minutes. But uh, it's what's on the box today. And it is indeed a bit of some Hawaiian tourist type show. Now, as for the date, I can only guess, but I think mid to late 60s. Now, uh, my print of it is on Super 8, and Super 8 was only introduced in 1965. But, um, yeah, that doesn't necessarily help. But judging from the one and only crowd shot in the thing, judging by the fashions, I actually would say 1965 to 68 or so would be a decent guess here. So anyway, this one kind of finishes up the dancing trifecta of this episode. So we've had Vegas showgirls and Paris burlesque dancers, Parisian, and now we're going to finish up with some hula dancing. Otherwise, I will post some of this footage separately to Archive Annex and some footage that I did not run in this episode, so keep an eye out over there for that footage. And otherwise, that's going to be it for today's archive. Join me next time when I go digging around for some souvenirs of my own, albeit in a pretty different way, if you get my drift. <laughs>